Hey, welcome back, band family. Let's start out today by warming up our faces. We're gonna give our chin muscles a good workout. So, grab your mirror, uh, have one handy, and let's try the EU face that we learned last time. And we're gonna firm up our chin muscles and we're gonna hold it for 20 seconds. EU, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Whew. Now that looks pretty goofy for me to be counting while I'm maintaining that position, but it's a great way uh, for us to, to develop those chin muscles. What I want you to do right now is pause the video, go back and do that two more times. If you do this three times a day, every single day, you're really gonna develop those chin muscles and it's gonna help your playing. Next up, let's assemble our neck and mouthpiece. But before we do, grab a reed, lick both sides and place it on top of your tongue to get it moistened while we assemble the rest of the instrument. Next, go ahead and grab your mouthpiece and your neck from the case. Remember that the neck is very delicate with this key mechanism on top, so be sure to hold it on the actual uh, main part of the neck and don't put any pressure on that key. Hold them so that your palms are facing you, thumbs pointed up, and line up the whole of the mouthpiece facing the same direction as the whole on the neck. Before you do this, you're probably gonna to wanna to grease that cork. Now, I've already greased my cork, but if you haven't yet done that today, go ahead and rub some grease on there and really work it in with your finger. If you have a newer saxophone, if it's brand new especially, that cork is probably very thick and very dry and it's gonna be hard to put together. So definitely put some cork grease on there every day and really work it in. You might wanna have a, a paper towel handy as well to wipe off your fingers when you're done, as well as wipe off any excess that comes out. Once your cork is all greased up, Line up the two parts and give them a push together, slight twisting motion as you do so, and you generally wanna push the mouthpiece on about two thirds of the way. Halfway, two thirds, something like that. That's a good spot to shoot for. Now, if your reed has been soaking in your mouth for a while, it might be ready to go. So we're gonna place it on the mouthpiece. Remember that we're gonna do flat to flat, okay? And we wanna make sure that it's centered left to right as well as even with the end. And if it goes too far, why, we'll never wanna press down on the top of the reed to get it back in position because that could break the reed. So we always move the reed around by using our thumbs on the reed just like this. So I'm gonna place that reed in the correct spot and I'm gonna hold it with my left hand, my left thumb. And then I'm gonna grab the ligature with my right hand. The ligature is shaped like a cone, like a, like a Christmas tree, same as the mouthpiece. There's a narrow end and a bigger end. And make sure that you uh, have the correct end facing up. The narrow end should be up. You're gonna very carefully slip the ligature over on top of the mouthpiece, being careful not to chip the reed. That's why it pays to take your time and do it slowly. Now, the uh, ligature is cone shaped and so the farther up it goes the looser it gets as I pull it down it's gonna get tighter and tighter uh, I'm gonna hold the top of the reed and the mouthpiece with my thumb and first finger of my right hand and then with my left thumb I'm gonna grab that ligature and pull it down until it's snug now as I do this it probably is, might have adjusted that reed position a little bit so I probably need to fix that so before I pull it down snug I'm gonna grab that reed with my thumbs, I'm gonna slide it around until it's centered left to right, and then so that it's even at the end. At that point, I'm ready to then take my left thumb, pull it snug, and I can also tighten those ligature screws just enough to keep the ligature from moving around on its own. This is a standard ligature, meaning that the, the, the screws are right there on the bottom, on the reed side, and no matter what kind of uh, ligature you have, the right hand always tightens those screws. It's never the left hand, it's always the right hand, even if you're left-handed. And there are other kinds of ligatures. There are what we call inverted ligatures. An inverted ligature, like we talked about in our lesson last week, has the screws on the top instead of the bottom. And uh, that this is not an inverted ligature. We know that for two reasons. First, because the screws are on the wrong side. If the screws are on the left side, no, it's not an inverted ligature. The second reason, if you look really closely, um, just the shape of the ligature is not quite right. It, it has to be designed to be uh, put on that way. And this one is a standard ligature, not inverted, so it would not go on that way. Here's an example of my inverted ligature. Now this one is not only inverted, it's also a different material. It's made of kind of a spongy, kind of a uh, rubberized fabric. And this particular ligature is inverted, meaning that when I put it on, for those screws to be on the right side, the screw has to be on top. So this is both inverted as, as well as a slightly different style 
of ligature. Now, some uh, inverted ligatures look just like a normal ligature. It's just that if you look really closely, the shape is slightly different. And more importantly, the screws are going to be uh, operated by the right hand while they're on top. Um, but uh, in other cases, uh, this inverted ligature does look quite a bit different than, uh, than the other ligatures. So for all the ligatures, though, we want to make sure that it's on the bottom half of the reed. I think I used the example last time that if the reed was a person, the ligature should be where the pants would be, right? You're going to want the, the, the pants to be down here in the bottom. You don't want them to be way up top like that, as if you were hiking your pants all the way up to your armpits. <laughs> so they should be on the bottom half. And really, the top part of the ligature, the, the waistband of the pants, should be right at the middle point of that reed. Now I'm all set to do some playing. Let's start out today by doing our air to sound exercise. This is where we're going to hold the neck and we're going to make the EU face slide the mouthpiece into position and blow air. Halfway through blowing air, I'll increase the pressure until I produce a sound. EU. You'll notice that I always bring the instrument to me. Because I'm playing the saxophone, it's not playing me. So I stay still, my chin stays up, and the instrument comes in. I also held the note for a long time. We want to make sure that for the next couple of weeks, every note we play is going to be very long, very steady. It's not going to stop and start. It's not going to waver. It's going to be very stable. Let's try the next exercise, which is instant sound. It's the same thing as air to sound, except instead of just blowing air and then increasing the pressure to produce a sound, we produce a sound right from the start. How did you do? Were you able to get a sound? This is a great exercise, both the air to sound and the instant sound, a great series of exercises to play every single day in front of a mirror. We want to make sure that we're watching ourselves in a mirror to prevent things like the bunched chin, to make sure our chin isn't coming down, and uh, just get a great sound every time. Some things to watch out for. Uh, make sure that your top teeth are on the top of the plastic. As this comes in, I should feel that pressure against those top teeth. In addition, I also want to make sure that there's a certain amount of pressure for my bottom teeth, but there is my bottom lip in between my teeth and the reed. I don't want my uh, teeth to pull back and just have my lip touching. It needs to be teeth, then the bottom lip, and then the reed. Another thing to think about is how far in we go. We want to make sure we're in far enough. Beginners sometimes don't go in far enough, and then they try to play the very tip of the mouthpiece and they either get a really thin, fuzzy sound or they can't get any sound at all. So make sure you go far enough in. Don't go so far in that you get that really crazy loud screeching uh, squeal. Make sure that you go in just to the right amount. As we mentioned in our last video, it's a great idea to practice different amounts of mouthpiece in your mouth to find out where it sounds best. Usually it's in the middle, so not too far out, not too far in, right in the middle. One way you can tell that you're doing everything correctly is if you produce the correct pitch when you play the mouthpiece and the neck together. The note you should get is F. So when you have bandmate set to alto sax and you have that, that switch on the right hand side set to the higher position for the flat symbol, that flat symbol looks like a uh, half of a heart with a line through it or pizza on a stick. If you have it set to alto sax and flat, the note that should come out is F. If it says E or D, something's gone wrong. Chances are you either have, uh, you don't have your teeth on the mouthpiece, you have uh, not enough mouthpiece in the mouth, maybe it's up at a weird angle, something's going wrong, so review yourself. Let's double check it yourself. Go ahead and grab Bandmate, set it to alto sax, and let's see what you get. Next step, I'm gonna show you how to assemble the rest of the saxophone. The first part you need is the neck strap. They come in all different styles and shapes. This is mine, yours may look different, that's okay. Go ahead and place it over your neck. This is not an optional part, you must have a neck strap to play saxophone. There are certain notes that you simply cannot play unless you have a neck strap. So, pop the neck strap on and then grab the end of the cord and there's a, an adjustment spot in the middle. Grab that and you can make it higher or lower. Now yours, again, may look different than mine. That's okay. Whatever yours looks like, grab the middle part and bring it up and down. This part can get a little bit tricky and you may have a difficult time maneuvering this at first until you figure out how the different straps work. So if you're confused, grab an adult and have them help you figure out how to adjust it. The part that, that usually throws beginners is they forget to hold this, art, this part and they try to grab this and they're pulling on it and then nothing moves. You really have to grab the end of the cord or the end of the strap and then it'll actually move more easily. Go ahead and look at the way your straps move through this piece right 
right there and figure out how to adjust it. The next part of the instrument I'm gonna pick up is the main body of the instrument. I'm gonna grab it by the bell with my right hand. I'm gonna pick it up. I'm gonna tuck it underneath my arm as if it was a football. And then I'm gonna set it on my leg, having a nice secure grip on this bell with my right hand the entire time. Now that it's in a stable position, I'll grab the hook at the end of my neck strap and I'm going to hook this uh, loop that's right there. Now we always hook it so that the hook goes down and through. I once asked a saxophone player, hey, why do all saxophonists hook it so that it goes down and through like that? And he said, I have no idea. That's the way we all do it. <laughs> and it took me a while to figure out that the reason most saxophone players attach it with the hook going down is because it's less likely for it to fall out as if it was going up. If you go up, sometimes it'll fall right out of the, the loop and your neck strap will come undone without you even realizing it. Some neck straps actually have a locking mechanism like this one where it will make sure it does not come out, but many saxophone straps don't have that. So just have it hooked down and through. Once that's in position, we're ready to attach the neck. I now have grabbed the neck and I'm going to position this at the top of the body lining it up carefully to make sure it's parallel. I wanna make sure I'm not coming in at a weird angle because that could potentially bend the metal. So I'll have it parallel to the body, straight in, and I will twist it until it goes all the way in. At that point, I'm gonna twist it until the ridge on the underside of the neck, the spine or the brace right here, is lined up with the rod that sticks up from the body. If you look at a saxophone body, you'll see that there is one delicate little rod that sticks right up at the top there. And that's the part that I wanna line up with the underside of the neck. I wanna make sure that that spine or that ridge on the underside of the neck is lined up with that rod. Um, as I'm doing this, I wanna be very careful not to apply any pressure to the delicate key in the top of the neck, being careful just to touch it by the sides. Once that's on there, I'm gonna gently tighten the screw that's on the right-hand side here to make sure the neck doesn't swivel at all. This is a little bit awkward in this method of assembly because to get at that screw, I have to kind of reach across this way or that way. But the idea is that I'm gonna tighten this up. If I was to look at this screw from a straight on point of view, I would tighten it by going clockwise. I would take the top of the screw and go to the right. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. It's a little bit awkward though because I'm actually facing this way. So I just need to imagine what it would look like if I was looking at it from that point of view. Righty tighty, lefty loosey. And now it's ready to go. Be careful you don't over tighten this. Um, this, uh, this thumb screw right here is usually made of relatively soft metal. And if you really uh, crank on it too hard, it's gonna break off. So that does happen and it's kind of an awkward thing to replace for the repair shop. So just finger tight, don't put a lot of pressure on there, just enough to keep the neck from sliding all over the place. Now my instrument is entirely assembled. The only thing left to do is to adjust the neck strap. So I will uh, take this part right here and tighten it up until it's nice and high. You'll notice that I don't necessarily have to grab the bottom of the neck strap because the weight of the saxophone is pulling it down. I can just hang onto the saxophone and push it up. And I've now assembled my saxophone. I find that this method of grabbing it by the bell and putting it under my arm like a football and then resting it on my leg is one of the most common ways that saxophonists assemble their instrument. And it's also the safest way. You'll see some people try to do it a different way and they might occasionally drop their instrument. So I highly, highly, highly recommend grabbing it by the bell, tucking it under your arm like a football and resting it on your leg as you assemble because it is the safest way to do this. Now I've mentioned that the neck strap is not optional, it's absolutely required. And that's because when we bring the saxophone up into plane position, we're actually gonna press our thumbs into the instrument and push the instrument away from us. And without the neck strap, well, the saxophone would just go flying off into the air. That would be bad. So I'm gonna bring it up into plane position, push against the instrument with my thumbs, and that pressure with my thumbs will cause it to pull against the neck strap. Before we do that, go ahead and place your hands on the correct spot. My left hand's gonna go right here. Thumb goes on this black key, uh, actually a black um, thumb rest there. And then on the front, there's a lot of different keys. We're gonna go for the biggest three for our three fingers, one, two, three. There's a smaller key above and below our first finger, our index finger. Don't press those, just use one, two, three, the three biggest ones. On our right hand here, I'm gonna put my right thumb underneath this black thumb rest and then I'm gonna put my right fingers on one, two, three, on the three keys that are down there. My pinkies 
have pinky keys, but we're not going to use them quite yet. Just realize that we will use those eventually. For this next part, you're going to need a band-aid or a piece of tape. So either get uh, a piece of tape or a band-aid and then come on back. Once you have your band-aid or a piece of tape, I want you to apply it to your right thumb. We're going to put this on the very end uh, segment of our thumb like this. It's going to go on the end segment of our thumb past the knuckle. So not on this part of our thumb, it's going to go right here. And I like to put the pad of the band-aid, if you have a band-aid, on the top part of your thumb like there. Uh, so not the front or the back or the part over here, but right uh, on the part that faces up. We're doing this for two reasons. First, it's going to protect your thumb as you're holding the instrument. And second, it's going to be a reminder of what part of your thumb should be touching the instrument. So now that we have our band in our thumb, as I place my thumb on this black thumb rest, I'm going to have the band-aid touching that black thumb rest. So this will protect my thumb and it'll also remind me exactly where to put my thumb. Sometimes beginners or even experienced players might get lazy and they'll push their thumb all the way over here like that because they feel like, oh yeah, I can, I can really hold, hold the instrument better. The problem though, is that they'll start to hit all these keys in the side over here by mistake, and they're gonna have a lot of problems with their playing. So don't have your thumb all the way over here. You want it to be right there on the end of your thumb. With my hands in the correct position, I can now press against the instrument and push it away from my body. As I push away from my body, I need to see where that mouthpiece is. It needs to be in a spot where it's basically gonna feel like it's going inside my nose. <laughs> but this is about, that's about where it needs to be. If I bring it into my mouth, I should feel the top of the mouthpiece click against my top teeth. It's not tall enough. Can you see that as I bring this into position, the mouthpiece is not pressed against my top teeth? It needs to be just a little higher. So I'm going to go back into the down position, grab here, and bring it up just a little bit. Now as I put all my fingers in position, bring it vertical and press forward against it. There we go. My head is level and my teeth are against the top of the plastic. Perfect. If you find that you have to raise your head up to get your saxophone in position, that means your neck strap is too high. If I go a little bit higher, if I have to raise my head up, that's a little bit too high, so I need to go down just a little bit. If you find that you have to bring your head down to get to the saxophone, that's too low. Same way that uh, since our thumbs are pressing out, if you actually have to press out but then lift up, that means that your saxophone's too low. So if it's too low and you actually have to like ugh, lift it up like this, that's it's too low. It needs to be pressed out, hitting your face, and clearly this is not right. <laughs> press out, I'm close, a little farther. There we go. The thumbs control the position of the saxophone. So one exercise you can try is to press down on both of these two thumbs, make it go back and forth, and that will kind of give you a feel for where your hands need to move. As you do this, we can then bring it up into position. The saxophone's gonna be basically straight up and down, or at least pretty close to it. If you were in a marching band, it would be perfectly straight up and down because they want it to look very uniform and uh, consistent down the line. However, ideally our saxophone is going to be angled very, very slightly where the top is a little bit to the left and the bottom is a little to the right. Now you're watching a video of this and I'm facing you, so it's going to be backwards. So if you were to, if I were to kind of face the same direction you are, Instead of my saxophone being straight up and down, it's going to be angled a little bit this way. So a little bit to uh, that way as you're looking at it. To make sure that the mouthpiece though fits into my mouth correctly, that means that my mouthpiece has to be angled slightly to the side. So as my saxophone's this way, I need to angle my mouthpiece to keep the mouthpiece flat to my mouth. Otherwise I'd have to turn my head. We don't want to turn our heads when we play saxophone. We want our heads to be straight up and down to allow our throat to breathe uh, freely. So, saxophone's nearly straight up and down, slight angle to the right, and we should be good to go. If you're standing up when you do this, perfectly easy. 
push those hands out in front of you and you'll be in great shape. If you're sitting down though, we need to make one small adjustment. You'll notice that when you play alto sax sitting down, your right leg will get in the way. So as you bring it up into plane position, oh, my right leg is in the way. So what you need to do with your right leg is angle it off to the side. I mentioned this in our class video uh, recently where alto saxes and horn players need to bring their right leg off to the side. So make sure you do that. And again, since this is reversed, since I'm facing you on the screen, your right leg is over there. So take your right leg and slide it off to your right side that way. And that way you can get your uh, right leg out of the way and you can hold the instrument mostly straight up and down. Remember there's that slight angle. Uh, sometimes uh, if you have a, a very young kids playing, like third graders, they're so short that they're having a hard time getting their right leg off to the side. And so for the little tiny kiddos, we sometimes have them play off to the side of their body. Um, this is definitely what we would do as adults if we had a giant, like a baritone sax, a really big saxophone, really huge saxophone. It's so long that you really cannot get your hand in the right spot with your leg there. So for adults that are playing berry sax, they will absolutely play it off to the side just like this. They'll have their legs to the left. But uh, for alto sax, adults play it pretty much in front of them with their right leg out of, out of the way. For fifth graders, I've never had the situation where a fifth grader was too tiny to be able to play the alto sax in front of them as long as their right leg was off to the side. Um, let me know if you have any problems with that. If you want to use like the third grader, you know, posture where you're off to the side like this, um, we can certainly make adjustments because I want it to be comfortable for you. But generally speaking, I, even the, my tiniest of fifth graders, they can still just put their right leg off to the side and play right in front of them. You will find some adults that choose to play in that position where it's off to the side, and that's fine too. Uh, that's just an alternate way of playing. The problem though is that I found that many people end up having really bad posture issues where they're all kind of like to the side like this because the saxophone's off to the side and their legs are over here. And, and then they're like, why, why can't I get enough air? What's wrong with me? Well, look at the way you're sitting, man. <laughs> so I highly recommend having the instrument in front of you, slight angle, and just make sure you get that right leg out of the way so that it's not in the way. I'm going to give you a little bit of extra content you can work on at home. I'm going to teach you how to play a note on saxophone and I'll also teach you to play a game. So we're going to learn to play a note today called B. Every note on saxophone has a letter name, A or B or C. And the note I'm going to show you today is called B. To play B, put your hands in position. Remember, our thumb is on the black rest right there. Our fingers go one, two, three, four, five, six. But I want you to release all those keys except that very first finger up there. So B is played as just one, no other fingers. That's called B. Let's go ahead and give it a shot right now. Have your instrument down, bring it up in front of you, insert it into your mouth, release all your fingers except for B, and go ahead and play. How did you do? Were you able to play a B? Remember that all of our notes, whether it's uh, air to sound, instant sound, or this new note of B, are very long notes. They're as long as possible without any wavering, any getting louder or softer, stopping or starting. It's just as long as we can possibly hold them. So that's our goal right now. Each day I want you to play some Bs on your instrument. I'll also teach you a game today. It's called How Low Can You Go? To play the How Low Can You Go game, you'll start with that same note of B, and then you'll add a finger at a time. Add a finger, add a finger, add a finger, add a finger, add a finger. You're gonna add a finger each time. You'll notice I didn't take off any fingers. I didn't switch my fingers each time. No, I kept all the higher ones on the instrument and I simply added them as I went down. If you get all your fingers in the right spot, you'll get a note for every single finger you add on down. If, however, some of your fingers end up releasing as you go, it's gonna sound weird. So that's the game. See if you can get uh, all the way down, or at least how far can you get? Let's give it a shot. How low can you go? How did you do? How far did you get down the instrument? I'll give you a few quick troubleshooting tips. If you find you're not getting the notes to sound, uh, make sure you get uh, that B first. If you can get the B, you're halfway there. And we also want to make sure that our fingers are all in the right spot. This is what usually uh, trips up students, uh, is getting the fingers on the wrong keys. In particular, it's that left hand. The right hand's pretty easy because there's only three keys to put your fingers on, and so you don't have a lot of options. Uh, what sometimes happens is students might get their hand out of position, but for the most part, they're going to go right there. 
The more common problem though is with that left hand because there are two keys on either side of that B key. I have a key above it and I have a key below it. So I wanna make sure that I'm using only that center key right there. Now this key above the B key, it's different on different instruments. On my particular instrument, it's kind of a, kind of a brass colored uh, key. Sometimes though, it's like, a, like any of the other keys, like a, like a white pearl inlay right there. So yours might look different and that's okay. Just realize that there should be a key above and a key below. We're not gonna use those, use the key, the big key right in the middle, as well as those two keys down there. So make sure that's in the right spot, add a finger as you go down and get all the rest of the notes. For the rest of the week, I want you to do some practicing each day. Start by strengthening your chin with some exercises in front of a mirror. Then go on to the neck and mouthpiece doing air to sound and instant sound. Make sure that you're holding the note as long and steady as you can for each of those exercises. Then put the instrument together, making sure you do it correctly. Practice getting your neck strap uh, set up. Don't forget to move your right leg off to the side and try playing that note B. Again, hold it as long and steady as you can. If you like some extra practice and some bonus material, then you can do the how low can you go exercise. Take your time, nice and slow, and see if you can get all the notes to sound. If you can, and you get down to that very bottom note, hold it as long as possible until you run out of air. So, until next time, go practice.